Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and this morning we'll look at verses 42 through 49. We covered the first part of verse 42 last week, but we'll, we'll hit it again, we'll read it all, and, and so we can understand the text that we're going to discuss this morning. So John chapter 1, beginning in verse 42. Let's follow along as I read. He, being Andrew, brought him, Simon, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, ask for your blessings upon your word as it has been read. And Father, now as we have sung the song, illumine us, Lord, speak to us, enlighten us, teach us, Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom for understanding, hearts that are open to receive the truth of your word, that it be planted deep, Lord, that it grow, that you make it water, and that it, or that you water it, that it would grow and bear fruit under the glory of your name. And so, Father, bless this time as we continue to worship it, yet at the same time yield ourselves to you and pray that you would have your way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's no doubt that there is a depth to the knowledge of God that we will never ever reach the bottom of. All eternity will be able to to search out the depths of who God is and never ever come to that point where we said, I've learned it all. I've reached a point now where I know everything about God that there is to know. Because no matter how deep we go in the depth of who He is, He's always deeper. He's always more. He's always greater. But this morning I want us to think about the depth of the knowledge that Christ has of you and the depth of the knowledge that Christ has of me. Now thinking about how deep and how well and how intimate He knows us, this might scare some folks. This might scare some people. Think He knows me? He knows everything about me? Everything about me? Things that I've done, things that I've thought, things that I've said that nobody else knows? He knows that about me? For those who may not know Christ as Lord and Savior, this can be a scary thing. But for Christians, I think it fosters a deeper relationship in Him. Because here's what He knows about all of us. And that now, knowing that He knows everything about us, everything, the good and the bad, He is knowledgeable of that, I can entrust all to Him. Your hopes and your dreams, you can entrust those to Jesus Your gains, your losses, your needs, you can hand those over. Your past, your present, your future, they can be given to Him. Your pains and your heartache, they can be given to the Lord. And even your sins and your eternity, entrusted to Him. Matthew 10.30 says, Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. It's an amazing thing. Now for some it's easier than others. (laughs) My wife, sorry, tries to help him out as she flips up her hair and finds a gray one and plucks it out herself and says, I'll lessen the number for God to count. But nonetheless, in all joking aside, He knows the very numbers of our hairs on our head. That's an amazing thing. But that's how deep He knows us. But here's the thing. Jesus knows you inside or outside. I want to get this right because I wrote it specifically. Outside, inside, inside and beyond. So look in our text in verse 42. And what's happening here is Jesus is in the process of calling His disciples. And some people want to argue, and 
I can see a basis for it, but I won't go too far there because the Scripture isn't necessarily saying that. But they say all of these were disciples of John the Baptist. That may very well be true, but it might not. Scripture's not saying it, so we just won't go there. But we saw last week in how God used Andrew in calling Simon. And so we pick that up again in verse 42. And as I read, He, being Andrew, brought Simon to Jesus. And I love this. Jesus looked at him. Now we can easily pass over that. And I'll be honest, thinking about this all week and and up until final preparation, I passed over it. But that just jumped out at me this morning. Jesus looked at him. I want you to think about all the times, all of the times when the gaze of our Lord fell upon Peter. There was a time where Jesus called Peter out onto the sea. And Peter was walking on the sea, experiencing something amazing, and then looked around and saw all the waves and began to sink. And thankfully, the gaze of our Lord fell upon him and he reached out and he lifted him up. But there was another time when the gaze of our Lord fell upon Peter. As Peter makes an incredible pronouncement of who Jesus is. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. But then in his humanness, right on the heels of that, Jesus begins to explain, I've got to go to the cross and die. And Peter says, not you, Lord. No way. Not you. Rebuking the Lord. And then the gaze of our Lord falls upon Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You've got things of man on your mind. And what did Satan want to do? Satan wanted to stop Jesus from going to the cross. Find another way. Worship me, and I'll give you everything. You don't need to do this. Find another way. And here Peter kind of plays into that and says, Not you, Lord. You don't need to go to the cross. You'll never die. Not you. And that's why Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. It's as if Satan was whispering into the ear of Peter, Stop him from doing this. And so the gaze of our Lord fell upon him and said, Get behind me. Get out of my way. I'm headed to the cross. But the gaze of our Lord also fell upon Peter as he makes this pronouncement to the apostle, you're going to deny me. Three times you're going to deny me. And then after that third denial, as Luke records it in chapter 22, verses 60 and 61, it says, And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The gaze fell upon Peter. But then also, after the resurrection, the gaze of our Lord falls upon Peter as they sit on the beach. And Jesus asked him three times, Simon, do you love me? Three times, reinstating him for service and and developing again that relationship that had been wounded but not severed. But again, bringing bringing Simon back to that place of full, full healing from his denials. And so here in our text... For the first time that we have a record, Jesus looks upon Simon. And as He looks upon him, He says, So you are Simon the son of John. Now here's an amazing thing. Jesus, looking upon him, changes his name. Changes his name. We have no explanation in the Gospel of John why this happens. It says right here, Jesus looked at him and said, So, you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And that's all we have as a record from the Gospel of John. But here's the thing that happened with Jesus. We don't need an explanation from Him, do we? We're not, we can't demand an explanation for Him doing the things that He does because He is all-powerful and He has all authority. And that's how He acted in this. All-powerful, all authority. But here's the thing about Jesus being God and what God does and how God deals with time. In a moment, Jesus just as easily as seeing the present sees the future and sees the past. Because here's the thing, we live in time, we live in the midst of it, we have to deal with it day in, day out. And the best way I can describe it is the way that it's been described to me, and it's such a vivid image. It's as if watching a parade go by as we look through a knothole in a wood fence, and we just see what's passing right in front of us at that moment. But God looks down upon time. Sees beginning and end, middle, all in a moment. And the amazing thing about God, and this has been stretching my mind for a week, is that God doesn't learn things. He knows things. He's all-knowing. And so here He looks at Simon. 
And I love this. So, you're Simon, son of John. You almost think Peter, probably, or Peter, Simon, stood up and said, Yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. But I'm going to change your name. Change your name. And, and what's amazing of this, again, the authority, the power, we don't find Peter saying, Wait a minute, don't change my name. He has that right. But it's as if definitely Jesus looks at Peter or looks at Simon and sees what he will become. She's the character that he will become. Cephas, Peter, the rock, the pillar of the church. And boy, didn't he go through some difficult times coming to that point where he lived up to the name that Jesus gave him. But that's sanctification, isn't it? That's all of us living up and growing into what we truly are, becoming that which Christ has made us, His children, saved, redeemed, but growing into that, developing into that. And so Jesus looks at Simon, a fisherman, a lost man, but He sees him as the rock man. And I'm so glad that Jesus sees that. And then He gives us a hint of what's to become to Peter. But it tells us how much He knows us from the outside, because He knew him as Simon, but the inside, you're Cephas and beyond. This is what you're going to become. This is what's going to be happening in your life beginning with the change that God makes, has to make in all of our hearts. Because never forget that Simon had a heart of flesh, but it was truly a heart of flesh that was a heart of stone that did not beat for God, just like all of us before Christ have. But we need a heart transplant. And God has to reach in and take out that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh that beats for Him, that lives for Him, that longs for Him. Otherwise, we'll remain hardened in our hearts Maybe hearing glimpses of God, maybe being spiritual sometimes in our talk, but never having a heart that longs for Him and beats for Him. And so here He is changing the name of gruff. And I always think of Peter as as a gruff kind of guy. Maybe that's not fair, but you know, you kind of look at his life. Fisherman, tough. He had to be tough. Spending all night sometimes out on the sea fishing. And I see him kind of as gruff, and here he is receiving this name change in such humility because he begins to follow Jesus. But then in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Now, be careful. I make decisions. You make decisions. We all make decisions. But as Jesus decides to do certain things, it's not like our decisions. Oftentimes, especially in the Gospel of John, Jesus will decide to to do something or I have to go through Samaria or I must needs go to Jerusalem. What this was were divine appointments that were going to be kept. And Jesus is the one instigating these things. He's the one orchestrating these things. And, And think on this. Maybe you're here and you braved this out in this weather. You decided to come here. But, I think Jesus orchestrated you being here. You made a decision. You said, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm here. You're here right now. You decided to come to church. But He brought you here. You're here. We're here to worship. And thinking about what happened here with Philip, I'm sure there's, there's been a time where he was acquainted briefly with Jesus. He knew some things about Jesus Because Jesus comes to him. And the first record we have is seeing him. And he says, follow me. And he follows him. Maybe you're here today. And you've been briefly acquainted with Jesus. But he's brought you here. He's orchestrated it that you're here. And maybe just as he says to Philip, even right now in your heart, he's saying, follow me. Follow me. We can learn a lesson here from Philip because a lot of times in commentaries that I've read, people want to give Philip a, a kind of a tough, tough thing. They, they want to say, well, Philip isn't mentioned anywhere. We never find him doing anything. You know, he's just kind of one of these guys that, that's real indecisive. You know, the Greeks come to him and he decides, well, let me get Andrew and we'll figure it out. Never making decisions on his own. But here's the thing about Philip. He was chosen by Jesus. He was an apostle. He's listed in Acts chapter 1 as one of the twelve apostles. And so regardless of anybody being critical of who Philip was, he had such an intimate relationship with Christ. But he follows Him. 
He humbles himself and he follows the Lord. And so in the same way, maybe right now, Jesus is calling out to you in in power and authority as He did with Philip, follow me, follow Him. Follow Him. Trust in Him. And so Philip, from that point on, is following Jesus. And then look in verse 45. What does Philip do? Philip finds Nathanael. And he says to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. What is he saying there? Something huge, monumental is being said there. He's saying all that the Old Testament promised us and looked forward to concerning the Messiah, we're placing all of that upon this one, Jesus of Nazareth. We found Him. We're not looking anywhere else. This is the one, Nathaniel. This is the one that we've had discussions about, that we're longing for. We've found Him. He's here. But I want you to realize something else that he's saying here, Philip. Jesus of Nazareth, that's true, that's where where Jesus was living at the time, so he had that Nazareth attached to him, or that's where he grew up. But then you see the son of Joseph. Was he the son of Joseph? In one regard, yeah, as, as the surrogate aspect of it, as Joseph taking him as his own, but he's the son of God. But here's hope for all of us. In the Christian faith, you don't come to Christ because you've gained every bit of knowledge of the Christian faith, of who Jesus is, and you're full of that, and then you readied yourself, and then you come to Him in faith. It doesn't happen like that. You come to Him in faith, you look to the cross at what He's done for you, you understand, I've sinned, He paid the price, I come to Him, and then at that point on, you begin to learn all about Christ. Philip didn't know everything about Christ at that moment. He didn't come and say, Ah, he's, he's the Son of God, born of a virgin. Mary was his mother. That's not, you know, he's not given a theological lesson here. This is all he knew about Jesus at this moment. But don't lose sight of all that he placed upon Jesus. This is the Christ, the anointed one. And boy, was he going to learn intimacies about Jesus from that point on. So often... I had this thought today, and it wasn't connected with this, but I think it fits in pretty good. So often we like to uh, cre- or allow superficial Christianity to be our enemy. Ah, oh, it's superficial. It's, you know, we've got to battle against that. But understand this. Every sea-going vessel at one point is cast out in shallow waters, isn't it? It's pushed out in those things. So superficial Christianity shouldn't be our enemy. It should be our starting point. Never our destination. And so the thing here is Philip, yeah, began very superficial. Oh, this is Jesus, son of Joseph. That's how everybody was looking at him. But he didn't stay there. And neither should we. We should always be longing to grow in our depth and understanding of who Christ is and and trusting Him more and more with every day. And so here he is. His understanding is limited. But he still is following Jesus And then we come to verse 46. Nathanael said to him, said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What prejudice is there? Because small towns, you know, and and I thought about this and I'm just going to do it. Uh, It exists here in our county, doesn't it? (laughs) Oh yeah, it does, it does. And I'll give you some examples of it. When I used to uh, write for the Parsons Advocate, I had somebody one time tell me in Davis, hey, you remember, you live in Davis. <laughs> I knew what they meant. Just this week, Sarah was in, uh, was in Elkins, had a Tucker County Mountain Lion shirt on. I called her a traitor. You know, kids go to Harmon. But anyway, she had this shirt on. A woman came up to her and said, oh, you're from Tucker County. Where are you from? She said, Canaan Valley? She went, oh, Canaan Valley. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. Notice how I said Canaan Valley. Isn't that what she said? She said, oh, notice how I said, oh. Yeah, that was it. She said, oh, Canaan Valley. Notice how I said, oh. And Sarah said, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Parsons, in between Parsons and Thomas. She was looking at her saying, oh. You know, there's such a, a prejudice that exists. It's real. I remember one time Frances and I sit at her coffee table and discuss this, and a lot of it's geographically, but it's real. 
Even yesterday, sitting with a dear friend of mine talking about Parsons and saying, the only thing good about Parsons is the park. At least they have that. I mean, this is real. This happens even in our county. So the reason I'm bringing this out is not to expose it in anybody that's here, but don't so quickly point your finger at Nathaniel and say, oh, what a prejudice. What guy filled with such prejudice? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Here's the thing. Jesus knows this. He understands this. And here's what happens. I love Philip's response. Come and see. He didn't debate him. He didn't fight with him over words. Come and see. Nathaniel, if this is how you feel, you come and see. And that should be the question to all of us. Oh, is Jesus real? Come and see. Is He really the Savior? Come and see. Did He really die on the cross? Come and see. You're not going to argue anybody into the kingdom of heaven. I promise you that. But come and see. Come and taste of the Lord See that He is everything that He has promised that the Scriptures say that He is. Come and see. And so that is great, great wisdom that Philip gives to Nathaniel. Come and see. But then verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus is not saying, Look at this honest guy. Or look at this perfect guy. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is, with Nathaniel, what you see is what you get. And sometimes what you see is what you get, and what you get is not so good. And that's what's happening here with Nathaniel. It wasn't so good, but Jesus is saying, hey, he's not talking behind my back. He's saying what he feels, and he's saying it right out there in the open. But here's one thing. He's not two-faced, but that doesn't make him perfect. But if somebody is out in the open and rude and crude and and full of prejudice, or somebody is two-faced, what imperfect lumps of clay we are that are placed into the potter's hands. Here Nathaniel is open about, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But after Philip has already said, we found the Messiah, he's like, can he come out of Nazareth? And Jesus takes this Nathaniel and molds him and shapes him, imperfect as he is, into a vessel of usefulness. And he does the same thing with us. No matter what kind of baggage you've got as you come into faith in Christ, he takes you as imperfect as you are and molds you and shapes you and crafts you because the potter's hands can do that. And he does it beautifully and wonderfully. And so here He is. Jesus has come forward and made this pronouncement, this honest, truthful pronouncement seen in the depths of who Nathaniel is. And He makes this out to him. And I love Nathaniel's response. How do you know me? What do you know about me? Where is this coming from? How do you know me? And then Jesus gives him something. And I wonder also, though, when when Nathaniel said that, I wonder if he was scared at that moment. Or was he arrogant? Either way, he asked Jesus, how do you know me? What do you know about me? And then he comes at him with this. He says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, Jesus is not saying, I was hiding in a mustard bush and I peeked out and I saw you. Or I climbed up in a sycamore tree and I looked down and and I was peeking on you. I was playing hide and seek and I saw you. There's depth here. There's intimacy. There's something looking deep inside of him because he's already said and exposed, here's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. He's already looking inside his heart. And then he's saying, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I know you. I don't know you just on the outside. I know you in the depths of who you are. But this idea of the fig tree, a lot of commentators are... are, not, they're not solid on what they think it is. It can mean home. It can mean uh, a place of peace, of rest. But oftentimes under the fig tree, meditation was taking place. They would sit there and they would pray and they would meditate. And so I think that probably all those things are somewhat true about the fig tree. What was Nathaniel meditating on under the fig tree? We don't know. But if you look at the context... And maybe, and I don't don't want to be dogmatic about this, but maybe, just maybe, he's under that fig tree contemplating 
the Messiah. Contemplating the depth of the promises of the Old Testament for the one that was to come. And here's why I'm able to base this and able to share that. Because he says, while you were under the fig tree, whatever was going on there inside of you under that fig tree, I saw it. And here's what he comes out with. You're the Son of God. He didn't come out with, well, how'd you see me? Or, where were you? Or, because that's why I believe he's looking into the depth of Nathaniel. Here were some thoughts that were going on, something deep in here that he realizes, wait a minute, what I was meditating on, he knows, he understands, this is not an ordinary man. You're the Son of God. The Son of God. And then he gives him the title, the King of Israel, and we won't get into that today, but the point of it is, he proclaims, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. As I was sitting there under the fig tree meditating, now I believe I am moved to the point in in my faith that you are the Son of God, Jesus. Three things. Three things that make God, there's more, but three specific things that make God uniquely God are the fact that He's omnipotent, He's omniscient, and He's omnipresent. I see these three things also displayed here with Jesus. The fact that He's omnipotent, you know, He's he's all-powerful. Here He is, He meets Simon, who's a, a tough fisherman. I'm changing your name. I have the power and authority to change your name right here on the spot. But also omniscient, to be all-knowing, to know your name's Simon, but it's going to be Peter. It's going to be Cephas. I know what's happening. I know what's going to come. And even thinking of here, looking deep into Nathaniel, I know you deeply who you are. But this is one that, for me, amazes me about Jesus because He is God and God is omnipresent. And here Jesus says to Nathaniel, while you were under the fig tree, where was Jesus at that moment? We have no reason to believe that Jesus was standing near that fig tree in the bodily sense, but He saw Him. Omnipresent. I can't explain that. I'm not even going to try to explain that. But I know that Jesus is God, and God is always present everywhere. So even now, Jesus, yes, bodily form, seated at the right hand of God. Jesus is everywhere. Jesus is here in our midst. And so He sees Him, knows Him, all-powerful. He knows you. Think about that. He knows you. Do you know Him? That's the question. He knows you. No matter where you are, whether you are of the faith or not of the faith, He knows you. Whether you're filled with prejudice like Nathaniel or filled with faith like Philip following Him, He knows you. But do you know Him? He died. He died for you. Paid the price for your sins on the cross. Will you follow Him? Like Philip, are you following Him? Because that cry goes out to us right now. Follow me. Follow me. Entrust everything to me. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises of the Old Testament, of Moses, of the law, of the prophets. He's it. There's no one else to look to. It's Him. And He calls out to us, lowly us, imperfect us. Follow me. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that He wants us to be associated with Him and follow Him in faith. And so, the question that begs an answer, are you following Him? Do you know Him? God knows the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. But nonetheless, that cry goes out to us today. And so, let's bow for a moment and have just a time of, of silence for just a moment asking our our Lord, the Lord of all, to speak to our hearts about that. God, what do You want me to get from this today? Am I following You? Do I know You? Praising Him for knowing us in the depths of who we are, as imperfect as we are, He knows us. So for just a moment, silently, ask God to speak to you deliberately what He wants you to get from this text today.